Good evening. I'm uh, Bradley Graham, co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lissa. And on behalf of the entire staff, I'd like to welcome you here. We're very fortunate to have with us this evening a, a writer who, in her work and her life, has been at the intersection of North and South America, North and South American cultures. A Marie Arana really has exemplified biculturalism. Uh, her husband, the literary critic Jonathan Yardley, who's here somewhere, Jonathan, um, has written that Marie is a true citizen of this hemisphere. And I think that's a, a very apt description. Born in Lima to a Peruvian father and a, uh, an, a, a North American mother, uh, Marie has continued to hold dual citizenship in Peru and the United States uh, and has residences uh, in both countries. And her writing, which has been in English, has sought to explore and explain both cultures, whether it was her memoir about her bicultural childhood, American Chica, Two Worlds, One Childhood, which was a finalist for the 2001 National Book Award, or her two novels, Cellophane about the Peruvian Amazon or Lima Nights. Uh, the other defining aspect to Marie's literary career, in addition to her bicultural perspective, has been her professional involvement in promoting and critiquing the works of others. In fact, she got her start in book publishing, becoming a senior executive at both Harcourt Brace and Simon & Schuster in New York. Then in 1993, she ventured into journalism as deputy editor of the Washington Post book review section, eventually becoming head of that section, a position that she held for 10 years. Currently, she's a writer at large for the Post and a senior advisor to the Librarian of Congress. And she sits on the board of the National Book Festival. She's also edited a collection of Washington Post essays about the writer's craft uh, titled The Writing Life, How Writers Think and Work, which was published uh, uh, about a decade ago and is used as a textbook for writing courses in a number of universities. Marie's new book, Bolivar, American Liberator, comes in the wake of uh, no small number of books uh, about the Venezuelan revolutionary. She notes in the acknowledgments that the Library of Congress alone has 2,683 volumes about Simon Bolivar. But most are in Spanish, many are in Bolivar's uh, words or written by contemporaries of his, and many more are very biased one way or the other about the controversial leader. So Marie has done a great service providing not only a balanced, well-researched account, but one that's in English and a wonderfully fluid, vivid English at that. Marie has a personal connection to Bolivar. Her ancestors fought on opposite sides from each other at the Battle of Ayacucho, which won Peru independence from Spain. As she explained in a recent interview, she heard a lot about that battle as she was growing up, and Bolivar became for her a symbol of the South American personality, its dreams, hopes, ambitions, and energy, as well as its flaws. Marie plans to speak uh, for a bit, and then we'll certainly leave time for questions. If you have a question, uh, please use one of the microphones here. As you see, we're well uh, covered tonight with cameras everywhere. Uh, we have um, C-SPAN over there on our own videoing operation over there and over there. Um, so it's, uh, it really is helpful if you could ask your question in the microphone. But if you can't make it to the microphone, uh, just uh, raise your hand and we, we can repeat the, the question up here. Uh, and then afterwards, Marie will be delighted to stay and sign copies of her book, which are available at the uh, cash registers up front. So if you haven't already, please silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Marie Arana. Thank you, Brad. What a, what a nice introduction. I uh, love politics and prose, as so many of you do. Uh, this is probably one of the great literary institutions, certainly of Washington, if not of the whole country. Um, I have loved it a long time since uh, Carla Cohen was here and Barbara Mead, and now under the aegis and the leadership of Brad Graham and, and Lisa Muscatine, I'm so happy to see that it's just thriving. And um, 
supporting not only writers like me, but readers uh, like you. And it's, it's a pleasure to see it sort of humming. Um, so thank you for, for asking me to come here. I see so many friends in the audience that um, I'm just going to pretend that I'm sitting by my fireplace at home with John and talking uh, a little bit about this book. It's a, um, it, it's, it's such a, it was such a pleasure to work on. And people find that hard to believe because it's, it's, um, it's not an easy thing, writing a biography of a very famous leader uh, on which everybody um, uh, has an opinion and on, on, uh, uh, on whom so much has been written already. It is true that there are uh, 2,683 books in the Library of Congress on Simon Bolivar. Uh, I would say 90% of those are in in Spanish, so I'm lucky there. But uh, this is a this is an extraordinary life, uh, and a life that was lived in the largest sense. I mean, a canvas that uh, is huge uh, stretches through most of of South America, and uh, a life lived large in other ways as well. Uh, Simon Bolivar was um, very uh, dramatic and um, commanding. Uh, personality. He was um, called Iron Ass by his soldiers because he rode 75,000 miles to liberate the six countries that he liberated. Um, it's really an extraordinary physical feat, if nothing else. But he also was um, a man of the Enlightenment, someone who uh, had been inspired at the youngest age by reading Voltaire and Montesquieu and, and John Locke and, and uh, came out of that experience actually, uh, probably at about 20, 21, with a very passionate sense of uh, his country, his, the colonial uh, yoke that uh, it suffered under, or he, at least he felt it suffered under. And um, he was all for liberty and freedom, uh, greatly admired the United States, greatly admired in many respects um, Napoleon, although there were aspects of his, uh, of, of the empire, the Napoleonic empire that he did not admire. But uh, this was a, a man uh, also of flesh and blood. He um, was a great womanizer. He had 35 mistresses, 37, I, th I guess it was, 37 mistresses uh, that we can count uh, after his wife, who was greatly beloved to him, died. Um, he was 19 years old when she died, and he went on to, to pledge that he would never marry again, but that didn't mean that he wasn't going to have a good time, and he did. Um, he was uh, a great dancer, loved music, um, said that he did his best thinking, really, on the dance floor. And whereas others needed to be away from the hubbub of, um, of life in order to get things thought through, he felt that a ballroom with lots of pretty women and lots of polkas and dancing was just the perfect place to uh, think through the, the Gordian knots that he encountered. And he would go back. Uh, in the middle of a dance, all sort of uh, happy and 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 uh, elated and sweating in the middle of it, go back to a back room and dictate three letters at a time to three different secretaries, uh, and then go back to the ballroom again and and think some more on his feet, literally. Um, I, I'm often asked why did you choose to write about Simon Bolivar, and I have to say that in my whole career. As a writer, I've had a long career as an editor for a long time, but as a writer, my whole career, I would say, has been to try to explain Latin America and Latin Americans to North Americans and to English speakers. It's not an easy task because there is, there are great, great differences and great divides of, um, of personality, heart, uh, between North Americans and South Americans. But every single book that I've written has been another brick, I always say, in the edifice of trying to explain 
who we are and um, how different we may think from North Americans. Of course, you may say as a bicultural person, and I, I see many faces whom I know out there who are bicultural, you also know that you're thinking with two heads and feeling with two hearts when you're living between cultures. And I wanted to get a sense of that other side, the Latin American side, which is so different, and its history is so different, to uh, North American English readers. So, and Brad is right that um, I had always been captivated as a child by the Battle of Ayacucho. I was not um, a very well-behaved child. And uh, I was very often dragged by my caller to sit in my grandparents' living room, which was dark and airless and sort of filled with you know, frightening busts and porcelains and things like that and old musty books. And I was made to sit there in that dark sort of chamber to um, contemplate my badness, and um, and I, I and it was on a hard. I remember it as being on a hard stool. Although my aunt and godmother, who is now 83, bless her heart, tells me that it was hardly a hard stool. It was a big, soft, plushy, cushion chair. So um, I'm not sure about memory there, but it felt like a hard chair, and uh, I was made to look at the um, portraits that surrounded me. And one portrait to my right was, uh, no, I'm sorry, portrait to my left was of Joaquin Rubin de Celis, who was my great, great, great grandfather. And he had fought at the Battle of Ayacucho. He was a Spanish brigadier general. And he was the first Spaniard to charge, and he was the first Spaniard to fall. And he was killed with a sword to his heart right away at the very beginning of the battle. He was on the left. On the right was a portrait of a very wan, wistful, beautiful young woman whose name was Trinidad Rubin de Celis. And she was the daughter of Rubin de Celis, but she had never met him. She was born a few weeks after that sword pierced his heart. And across from me was the rebel general that Trinidad eventually married at the age of 16. And the rebel general, his name was Pedro Cisneros Torres. He fought, he charged down that hill in, uh, in the Battle of Ayacucho and with Bolivar's forces managed to free uh, Peru from, and ended, by the way, uh, with the Peruvian freedom ended all of Spanish rule in Latin America. So I always felt, even though I was sitting there being punished for being bad, you know, rebellion was really great. Uh, <laughs> throw over, throw over the old guys, throw over the, the, the yoke. And so I was, I was been fascinated with, with Bolivar ever since. But Bolivar is a really towering figure and I wanted to get, give you a sense of that by sort of reading at uh, some of what I've written about who he is. By the time he, um, exactly 200 years ago, in 1813, by the time he began his admirable campaign, when, in which he was not known at all, um, he was beginning to be known uh, in South America, but by the end of it, by the end of 1813, he was known in really around the world. In Washington, John Quincy Adams and James Monroe agonized over whether their fledgling nation, founded on principles of liberty and freedom, should support his struggle for independence. In London, hard-bitten veterans of England's war against Napoleon, mostly Irish, signed on to fight for Bolivar's cause. In Italy, the poet Lord Byron named his boat after Bolivar and dreamed of emigrating to Venezuela with his daughter. But there would be five more years of bloodshed before Spain was thrust from Latin American shores. I'm, see, I'm sorry, 14 more years. It was a 14-year war. I'm just reading in the middle of it, so it's, uh, the five years is wrong. But there were 14 years of war and of great bloodshed before Spain was thrust from Latin American shores. At the end of that savage and chastening war, 
one man would be credited for single-handedly conceiving, organizing, and leading the liberation of six nations, a population one and a half times the size of North America, a landmass the size of modern Europe, the odds against which he fought, a formidable established world power, vast areas of untracked wilderness, the splintered loyalties of many races, would have proved daunting for the ablest of generals with strong armies at his command. But Bolivar had never been a soldier. He had no formal military training. Yet with little more than will and a genius for leadership, he freed much of South Spanish America and laid out his dream for a unified continent. Despite all of this, he was a highly imperfect man. He could be impulsive, headstrong, filled with contradictions. He spoke eloquently about justice, but he wasn't always able to meet it out in the chaos of revolution. His romantic life had a way of spilling into the public realm. He had trouble accepting criticism and had no patience for disagreements. He was single-handedly, I mean, excuse me, he was singularly incapable of losing a game of cards. It's hardly surprising that over the years, Latin Americans have learned to accept human imperfections in their leaders. Bolivar taught them how. Now, as Bolivar's fame grew, he was compared to George Washington. He was called the, uh, the um, George Washington of South America. And there were good reasons why. Both of them came from wealthy and influential families. Both were ardent defenders of freedom. Both were heroic in war, but apprehensive about marshalling the peace. And both resisted efforts to make them kings. Both claimed to want to return to private lives, but they were dragged into to the public sphere of shaping governments. And both were accused, as we all know, of undue ambition. There, really, the similarities between George Washington and Simon Bolivar end. Bolivar's military action lasted twice as long as Washington's. The territory he covered was seven times as large and spanned an astonishing geographic diversity from crocodile-infested jungles to the snow-capped mountains of the Andes. Moreover, unlike Washington's war, Bolivar's could not have been won without the aid of black and Indian troops. His success in rallying all the races to the patriot cause became the turning point in a war for independence. It's fair to say that he fought both a revolution and a civil war. But perhaps what really distinguishes both men, both Simon Bolivar and George Washington, can be seen most of all in their written work. Washington's words were measured august, dignified, the product of a cautious and deliberate mind. Bolivar's speeches and correspondence, on the other hand, remind me much more of Thomas Jefferson. They were fiery and passionate and elegant and beautifully wrought. They represent some of the greatest writing in Latin America. Although much was produced in haste on the battlefields and on the run, the prose is at once lyrical and stately, clever but historically grounded, electric but yet deeply wise. It's no exaggeration to say that Bolivar's revolution changed the Spanish language for his words marked the dawn of a new literary age. The old dusty Castilian of his time with its ornate flourishes and cumbersome locutions in his remarkable voice and pen became another language entirely, urgent, vibrant and young. So you see, this was a man who represented for me, and if I wanted to build this edifice of explanation of who Latin Americans are, Bolivar was really it, because um, he represented the history that really defined the, um, the continent of South America. His the revolution that he fought was so different, so in such contrast to the revolution that was fought here. He had to uh, employ, when he, when he 
ha started, and it was a white man's war, essentially, because he was uh, a very rich man. He came from probably the richest family in Venezuela and, and one of the richest families in all of Latin America. He was a very, very wealthy man. His um, parents had, well, his family had been in, in uh, uh, Venezuela for, at that point, 200 years and, uh, or more. And he ha they had accumulated wealth of, ca of cocoa uh, plantations, indigo plantations, copper mines. They owned 12 properties in Caracas alone. Uh, it, was a, it was a tremendously rich family. And it began as a kind of an aristocratic uh, discontent with the colonial power that Spanish, the, the Spanish held in South America. And people don't really realize this, but Spain was very, very um, uh, assertive in making sure that its colonies had no contact with each other. They were like spokes of a wheel. They, if there were, uh, you could not travel from colony to, from vice regal, uh, one area of, of vice regal uh, Latin America to another. Uh, you could not do commerce. You could, you were prevented as a colony of Spain from uh, do, uh, doing any manuf manufacturing at all. You were prevented from owning a mine. You were prevented from any kind of, um, of commerce whatsoever. And um, it was punishable by execution. So you see the, um, the, the, the whole business of, you can imagine, putting together a revolution in a place that is so isolated by its former co colonial power was a very difficult thing. And this is what um, Bolivar came up against. It wasn't automatic that countries would welcome him to liberate them, even though they wanted to be liberated. It wasn't automatic that the races would all play a part in it. In fact, the races kept shif shifting. Uh, in the beginning, the, um, the blacks, on whom so much of the revolution depended, were aligning themselves with Spain because they knew what that meant. They didn't know what the revolution would bring. But feeling that they already knew the evil that existed in the colonial system, they could deal with that, but they didn't know what was coming with the, with the um, uh, white aristocrats of Latin America, and so they were very hesitant. It wasn't until Simon Bolivar, who had been exiled for the second time, uh, or went into exile for the second time because the revolution kept failing, uh, the um, republic, each republic that was set up, first by Francisco Miranda, who himself is a tremendously uh, marvelous romantic story, fell apart. The second republic fell apart, and he found himself, Bolivar, in Haiti, welcomed by Alexander Petion. Now, if you know the history of Haiti, what had happened in Haiti was uh, they had had a, a very bloody revolution in which all the whites were either sent running or killed, slaughtered, uh, en masse. And Alexandre Petion said to, to Bolivar, you will never win this thing. You, you are going back now for the Third Republic. I will help you. I will give you ships. I will introduce you to all of these English commercial uh, establishments and men who can, who can help you. Um, but you must promise me one thing, and that is your next time out. This was already 1815. Your next time out, the moment you hit the shore in Venezuela from Haiti, you must liberate the slaves. You must end slavery. And Bolivar had thought about this for a long time because, in fact, um, with probably a greater moral uh, instinct than the American founders of Jefferson or Washington. He couldn't imagine that there could be, that you could fight for liberty, that you could fight for freedom with slaves in the country. 
he uh, immediately understood what Pétion was saying and, in fact, had already figured that out. He knew that he was going to have to reach out and get the indigenous and the, by at that point, 300 years into uh, the colonial history, there was a huge mulatto and mestizo population along with the blacks and the Indians. Great slave trade, obviously from the Atlantic slave trade. And he knew that he was going to have to engage those um, many races in order to, um, to win the revolution and to really, really get it going. It wasn't easy, you can imagine. His, um, there were lots of suspicions. There were lots of, uh, uh, at the time, uh, every general wanted his own country, really. Uh, the, the fiefdoms um, was, were very difficult to fight for Bolivar, but there was a point at which, and it was a very daring point, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, at which the whole tide of history changed. And that was that he engaged, managed to engage enough of the uh, mestizos and mulatos who lived in, in Caracas and out in the plains who were the horsemen of the Apure, who uh, were, were able at least to give him the impetus or the courage to think differently about how the revolution should be fought. And he had the very daring thought. This was in the middle of um, 1819, when the already much blood had been spilled, and uh, the revolution had grown so bloody that half the population of, uh, the, of, of, of Venezuela had been killed in the process. Um, some ta towns had been completely wiped off the map. He had the thought, well, maybe I will cease to worry about Venezuela and hit the Spaniards in the heart by crossing the Andes and going to New Granada, which is now Colombia. It was a ridiculous thought. It was rainy season. They were on the plains of the Apure. He was in, uh, looking at the Andes. The plains of the Apure are parched in the summertime and absolutely flooded in the rainy season. Whole rivers become seas. The um, plains become lakes, great lakes. And um, no one would have suspected that anybody would be so foolish as to take an army with the cattle and the women and the soldiers through this uh, flooded plain and then over the snow-capped mountains of the Andes, which, you know, everybody knows. You are um, taking an army over peaks that are 18,000 feet high. Uh, was a, it was a revolutionary thought, if I may make a pun, and uh, nobody would suspect that he would attempt it. Why, why would you go to another country when you haven't even won liberation for your own? He kept it a secret. The soldiers did not know where they were going. They just knew that they were wading through the water, that they were, uh, you know, sometimes um, they're having to the, the carry the women on their back. The cattle were expiring one after the other. And he got to the bottom, sort of the, the, of the range that divides the Venezuelan part from the New Granadan part. And he finally explained what he wanted to do. The soldiers were for it. He took a battalion, several, an army of 2,500 people with women, with uh, some of the officers had their wives, and uh, with cattle and horses and whatnot, and with his printing press, because he carried his printing press everywhere he went, he really did feel that words were um, the greatest weapon. And he pulled it off. He went through the Paramo de Pispa, which is the highest point where the Spanish had no garrisons for miles. And he went over that uh, Paramo de Pispa, and he came down the other side, 
in tatters, you could imagine. There were so many who died. About a third of the, of the British expeditionary force died in the process. All the, the cattle were gone. Uh, many of the horses did not make it. But the number of people who came down the other side of the mountain were terrified the Spaniards, and they were enough to, um, to actually send the viceroy sitting in Bogota running. He ran, he put on a grimy hat, he put on a, a poncho, and he left a million pesos on his desk, and he, and he, and he ran for, uh, for cover. Uh, they were detonating, you can imagine, in this, in detonating all the um, ammunition so that he wouldn't get at it, so that Bolivar wouldn't get at it. And um, he rode into the capital, to Bogota, all by himself. And there are wonderful descriptions of that ride, which is the way that I start the book. Um, it's a marvelous story. It's full of adventure. As I say, it's full of, of romance. I could talk about his, um, his mistress, his favorite mistress, Manuela Sainz, about whom um, much is known, but uh, not enough is written. She was a great beauty, fierce, um, had a, as we say in Spanish, no tenía pelo en la lengua, um, which is, she said whatever she wanted to say. She was very direct. She had opinions. She spoke up. She dressed like a man. She, um, she was like nothing Bolivar's generals had ever seen. Some adored her. Some despised her. But she was, at three times in his life, the person who saved him from assassinations. The stories are dramatic. They're absolutely um, hard to believe that something like this could happen. Abs the completely cinematic, really, story of um, Bolivar sick in, his, in the palace in Bogota. And um, Manuela Science is called. She, he sends a messenger to bring her because He's so sick, and everybody around him is sick as well. It's the most unguarded moment Bolivar had experienced in his whole career. He sends for Manuela Science. She says, no, I'm too sick. And he sends another messenger and says, no, you have to come. I'm feeling terrible. I need your help. And she puts on her galoshes and goes through the rain and gets through the palace. And um, he's sitting in a tub trying to cool his fever because he's so ill. And she comes in and she reads to him, and eventually um, he gets up, goes to bed, falls into a great torpid sleep. She does as well. And suddenly she awakes with a barking of dogs. And it is a whole organized assassin assassination of 150 people who have converged on the palace to kill Bolivar. At this point, he is quite famous, he is quite powerful. Uh, the, his, some of his uh, generals, and certainly his vice president, are very suspicious of his power. And he says, what do we do? And she said, he doesn't have a pair of boots. His boots have been out, gone out for cleaning. He's got a sword. He's got a pistol. Uh, and he says, well, I'll just go open the door, and she, because someone is banging at the door at that point. And she said, no, 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 get dressed. He gets dressed. She says, put on my galoshes and jump through the window. <laughs> he puts on his mistress's galoshes, jumps through the window. He had just said to a friend a couple of days before, that would be a great getaway. As it happens, there are no guards outside, so he's able to jump. Manuela Sainz goes to the door, flings it open. There she is, the um, general who, who on the other side. Uh, actually, um, several soldiers on the other side describe her as this beautiful f sort of apparition with a sword in her hand and a hand on a hip and saying, what do you want? And, uh, of course, the story goes on from there. I'll let you read it for yourselves. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite amazing at, at every level. But um, so you can see uh, my excitement as 
someone thinking, how do you explain the Latin American personality, the Latin American character to a North American reader? You explain it by showing how different the colonial system was, how much history, and in this case, it's six uh, republics that emerged after the revolution. And you describe it by this sort of insane kind of um, light, palatial, the, the, the palace life uh, that Bolivar lived and uh, how it changed from country to country as he progressed from Venezuela to New Granada to Ecuador, liberating Panama on the way, down to um, Peru, which was uh, the hardest of all, the hardest nut to crack. Um, I hope you'll enjoy reading it. I want to hear your questions. Um, and this is, uh, I, I hope you'll have many questions for me because this is always, uh, for me, my favorite part. Thank you. Yes. That was a great, uh, that was a great uh, speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. I came out here to buy the book, number one, because I read five or six fabulous reviews of it. I didn't realize you had an in-house uh, reviewer, John, over there. He writes, I read him every weekend, but this was oh. superb. And I can't wait to look at the book. i am also Thank lived you. half my life in South America. Huh. Knew a lot about Bolivar, but I've learned just from listening to you a number of things, including that his wonderful stuff in Colombia and the Battle of Ayacucho. Um, we hear a lot, and it irritates me as somebody who loves this hemisphere, to read, to hear about the late departed, His Excellency, the President of Venezuela, who uses Simon Bolivar as a tool to badly govern a wonderful people in a wonderful country. To what extent, since Bolivar lived a long time in Venezuela, to what extent is was Chavez distorting history and just doing the usual crap that he did for 14 years? Or is there a serious historical responsible basis for saying, for using Bolivar as part of the Venezuelan package? Thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Um, mm. There is very little, I, I speak about this in the epilogue of the book, there is really very little um, to compare with Hugo Chavez and, and Simon Bolivar, except for the thing that everybody since, since Bolivar died, and he died absolutely destitute, penniless, he had given up all his, his riches. Um, he, he, uh, and Hugo Chavez, by the way, died a very rich man. Uh, opposite uh, experiences there. But, um, but uh, Bolivar was, uh, how, um, he was, let, let me put it in the, most, in, in the most concrete ways, Bolivar knew that he was a, a liberal. He knew that he was a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, and he was cast by his enemies as being anti-liberal. It's a mistake. He was not anti-liberal. He was the most, one of the most liberal, enlightened leaders in uh, the Western Hemisphere. But through the years after he died, and uh, he died uh, completely rejected by his own homeland and on the way to exile, it didn't take 10, 15 years before he was brought back as the great hero. His greatest general, well, I should say his, his closest general, Daniel Florencio O'Leary, said of him, Irish, uh, whom Bolivar loved, said of him, um, there's something about Bolivar, it's the magic of his prestige. Well, there were uh, at least two presidents before Hugo Chavez who did exactly what Hugo Chavez did. Take Bolivar's um, legacy and use it as their own. It's amazing to see right People on the right use him. People on the left use him. Um, for uh, Hugo Chavez, who I think Bolivar would have been horrified to see how his name has been used in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. But, you know, it's been used many times before. Uh, he was constant, he's constantly being, being brought out by leaders throughout 
Latin America to argue different points, which is why people are very, very confused about just who Bolivar was and just what he believed in. Um, what Hugo Chavez and Simon Bolivar do have in common is this. Bolivar dreamed of unifying all of Latin America. He wanted a unified uh, America because he felt it would be stronger, uh, more influential, a greater, uh, shall we say, counterpoint to the United States, which was growing very strong. Hugo Chavez, too, has a dream. And he has, you know, the, the, the Bolivarian nations now, who, which are Ecuador and, um, and uh, as you know, Bolivia and Cuba. Uh, they all call themselves the Bolivarian nations that have very little to do with actual Bolivarism. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, a two-part question as a, a bicultural person. One, uh, could you enumerate several other, uh, what, what you would consider to be gross misconceptions <laughs> about Bolivar on the part of uh, North Americans, how we misperceive his legacy and how we misperceive him. And secondly, uh, any truth to the story I've heard about the locket with George Washington's oh. hair? Yes, yes, let me start with that first. There, uh, um, George um, Washington Park Custis, who is the grandson of, or grand, uh, what was he, grand nephew, really, of, um, of mm -hmm. Washington, sent, wanted to send a, a medallion with a clipping of George Washington's hair inside to Bolivar because he uh, felt that George Washington himself would have wanted to be associated with Simon Bolivar's name. And it was Lafayette, actually, who said to Custis, um, of all the people, of all the people in the world that George Washington most admired, it was Simon Bolivar. And uh, Marquis de Lafayette said that himself. And so the medallion was sent down. It was, for Bolivar, the absolute pinnacle of achievement. He admired uh, Washington. He admired Jefferson. He admired North American, the North American founders, although he knew that his task was very different and that he could not emulate them. Uh, but he treasured this medallion uh, for all time. And actually, um, it's still in Venezuela, it's very much on, on display, and if you go down to Caracas, you can see it. Um, the question about biculturalism, the question is... Um, misconceptions. About misconceptions, yeah. You know, uh, Bolivar was, was uh, his whole life was lived with people having misconceptions about him. Um, he, when he was fighting for the liberation of Peru and he was wending his way back to his homeland, there were rumors that he wanted to make himself king. You know, and these were rumors that were put forward by his enemies, put forward by his friends, put forward by everybody. Uh, and it was a way of, of, of tarnishing his name. And he, um, he was the furthest thing from wanting to be king, in fact, because when he met San Martin, uh, when Bolivar met the other liberator coming from the south, from Argentina and Chile, and they met in Guayaquil, the one thing that really, really uh, turned Bolivar against San Martin was the fact that San Martin really believed that um, South America should have a king, that Peru should have a king. And he had actually sent people out to Europe to find a king to come and rule in Peru. And Bolivar said, no, that's, I'm sorry, but we've, you know, we've uh, sacrificed a lot of lives precisely to get rid of kings. So there are misconceptions there as well. And, you know, they were used against him even by South Americans, so I'm not surprised that there are misconceptions about him from North Americans. Thank you for, for your question. Hi. Um, well, like yourself, I, I grew up here, uh, but I'm from Guatemala, and I have to confess I know very little about Simon Bolivar, and I'm looking forward to the reading. But uh, as, a, as, a wealthy, uh, as a son of a wealthy family, 
Uh, was he educated in Spain? Was he, or was he, yes? It's a great story. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I have to believe that if he was educated abroad, uh, coming from a wealthy family, he must have at some point learned something about history. And then, of course, because his traversing the Alps, or the, uh, the Andes is similar to Hannibal's uh, right. going over the Alps to uh, sack Rome. Right, so. except Hannibal prepared for two years, and <laughs> Simone just did it. <laughs> thank you. Right. Um, thank you. The, um, the, the, the thing that's amazing about Bolivar's education, he was an inordinately erudite man. He, um, he could speak, you know, languages. He read Rousseau in French. He read Cicero in Latin. He, he was um, uh, educated because when he went to Spain as a very young man, he was sent over at the age of 16. Why? Because his uh, mother's family, he was a, a complete orphan by this time. His mother was dead. His father was dead. Uh, and he was sent over by his family to see if he could persuade the, uh, the, the Spain to actually give him a baronetcy or um, you know, a, 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 some noble position. And he ended up in the tutel under the tutelage of a wonderful Venezuelan who had lived in, in Spain for a long time, the uh, Marquis de Ustaris, who brought him in. He had never had a son. Bolivar was an orphan. He brought him in, taught him everything, had tutors come in, and Bolivar ended up uh, really astonished by his own interest in history and literature uh, and music. And he was trained in everything from, um, from Ustadis's personal uh, library and also from the, the tutors, and simply the people who came in. Uh, he was um, really, as I say, a person who changed the Latin American language because he had um, listened to uh, the European philosophers of the time. He had read deeply. He appreciated good prose. Um, he, was a, he was a deeply educated man. Okay, since you may have already answered my question, I'm okay. going to revise it into something of a filibuster, for which I apologize. No, no. But why did Bolivar refuse to work with San Martin? And of course, San Martin had offered to serve under Bolivar, and certainly was a hugely talented military commander. His crossing the Andes was much more successful than Bolivar's. Yes, for uh, San Martin also crossed the Andes. He crossed the Andes, yes, in his, um, and, in, in, and San Martin all had something very similar to Bolivar also, which was that he too uh, wanted to unite America. Uh, what happened in the process was San Martin was very sick in the process. He was, by the time he reached Peru, he was already very much of an opium addict. He had uh, terrible arthritis. He had been a soldier since he was 12. Uh, he had terrible arthritis over the years. He was carried um, on a litter, really, over the Andes. Uh, but uh, he, when he, they actually sat down and met in Guayaquil for the first time, and San Martin was trying to say, come help me with Peru. And Bolivar was not convinced that he wanted to help this man. Um, the, the meeting was very awkward. The meeting was, uh, it's very famous. Uh, nobody was in the room to record it, but af as, t as years went on, there was enough uh, that was written about it by both sides that we know pretty much what went on. But, um, but San Martin wanted Bolivar to come, and he even said, I will serve under you. And Bolivar knew that that was the, exactly what he didn't want, because the person who serves under you will have a greater prestige than the person who is actually ruling. So he said, no, that's impossible. And when San Martin... That point? I don't understand that point. Well, uh, uh, Bolivar actually writes that in a letter. He said, I, uh, San Martin uh, wanted to serve under me, and I knew that that would be a mistake, because he would have the moral advantage of having surrendered himself to me. So um, uh, Bolivar re refused really to help him very much. He said, I'll send you a few battalions. But uh, San Martin at that point left Guayaquil knowing that uh, in order for, uh, Bol for Peru to be free, for Bolivar to come and actually bring his liberating army, he would have to make himself scarce, which is exactly what he did. He left Lima in the middle of the night. He took a boat and went to Ancon waited there a little while to see if he would be called back, and then eventually went down to Mendoza, 
Argentina and then went into exile in France. But um, it's one of those great moments in history when you have two liberators sitting in the same room and really vying for authority. Thank you. What happened to slavery in the Six Republics? Did they take the Haitian advice and end slavery? Immediately, oh, they yes, did. Very good. immediately. Although uh, it was a, a lot of it was immediate in word and oh. not in actual act. Uh, it was very, very hard for, for some people to let go of their slaves. But you have to imagine the revolution when the slaves are actually, the, the slaves have been freed, they've been told that um, if they join the army, they will, they will uh, gain their freedom immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so interesting to me that so few Latin Americans, and I've come across this, don't realize that it was really the black forces and the Indian forces that won mm -hmm. our revolutions down there. You know, and I've had um, a great poets say to me, "How can you speak such rubbish?" You know, it was a, it was a, the, all those white aristocrats who were leading, uh, but no, it was it was uh, battalion after battalion mm. of of blacks and mestizos and mulatos and Indians who mm. actually won the revol won the freedom mm. against Spain. And right. Bolivar was very aware of that. Thank you. Oh, and can I ask, um, was there any chance of a united South America? You know, he tried in um, 1926, he held um, what is they call the precursor to the, uh, to the OAS, which was he tried to, to uh, call a conference of all these republics. He called it the Pan-American Union. Mm -hmm. And he had written a whole, you know, a whole sort of vision for this greater America. Mm -hmm. And um, people didn't come. They, uh, they stalled, people died on the way, uh, there were too many animosities. First he didn't want to invite the United States, then you know, his vice president invited the United States. And there was a kind of a, it became, um, as he said, that's when he said we have, this revolution has plowed the sea mm -hmm. because he couldn't really move what he really wanted to move, which was the unification of all of Latin America. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very brief. I just would like you to add a footnote to your answer about the education of Bolivar by including Andres Bello in your. Andres Bello absolutely was one of his early tutors. Right. Yes, and uh, and he was tutored by yes by a number of, of people in Venezuela. Andres Bello was a, one of the great uh, literary figures of Latin America, and he happened to be n not too much older than Bolivar, and he was brought in as a tutor. And, and he created um, Chile, for all I know. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. You mentioned one gentleman who's always in interesting for me, and that's O'Leary. Oh, Would yes. you mind just talk a little bit about the person, who he was, and yes. uh, what influence he had in Bolivar? Mm. And then, if I could push you a little, second question, but it might give you an idea for your next book or your pan second one. Uh, this lady, Sainz, right, his Science. mistress, is there any uh, correspondence between her and, say, Madame Lynch, who also was Irish in Paraguay? And in the broader framework in which you ob obviously write and operate, ac uh, operate in, okay, um, the emergence of f the female in 19th century Latin America as a political leader or as a, an influence on the male leaders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. First, uh, Daniel O'Leary, you know, uh, when the <coughs> Napoleonic Wars were drawing to a close and you had, really, you had a militarized Europe, you had a lot of soldiers who, who came back to, uh, to England and, and Ireland and had no means of income. And it was these people who were recruited. Uh, and some of them came, you know, they, they named whatever type, they, the, the recruitment was really very loose. Uh, it was done by someone who really didn't know much about soldiering, a uh, Venezuelan uh, diplomat who sat in London and just was recruiting like, like mad. And um, so people would come and they'd say, oh yes, I was, you know, a colonel, lieutenant colonel. And in fact, he was just, you know, a scrub. Um, but they would come over, and they were they, and, and they were outfitted in these majestic uniforms, and they were tottered all over London, 
and they were given, you know, big champagne goodbyes, and, and off they would come to this absolutely wild revolution where, you know, the, the soldiers were barefoot, and they were fighting with spears, uh, and they were fighting with sticks, and um, they were ludicrous, you know, parading around in uh, these fancy, you know, sort of European thing, and they could barely uh, lumber along with all the heavy uh, equipment that they were carrying. Uh, Daniel O'Leary was one of those, um, but he, and he was very, very young, and uh, Bolivar identified him very early, and uh, made him a general very quickly. And Daniel O'Leary was really uh, not, uh, not only one of his best generals, but one of his closest friends in whom he could confided. Uh, Bolivar really liked having, I don't know where it came from, I can't explain it, but he liked having uh, English and Irish um, assistants and generals around him. His, his little tight force of, um, of the people who were his secretaries and his assistants were almost entirely um, English and Irish, and he liked that. I mean, he had he had spent time in London, and he appreciated, I think, um, uh, their experience in Europe in the Napoleonic Wars, and he elevated them. And Daniel O'Leary was certainly rewarded him by collecting all of his letters. If you go and you know, 32 volumes of letters and um, correspondence and, and, and speeches. Uh, it was Daniel Florencio O'Leary who did it all, who collected it all, annotated it all. It was quite a gift back to Simon Bolivar. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> oh, what I, what I was doing? Oh, general sort of obstreperous behavior, Don. <laughs> I, was, um, I was a pretty cheeky kid, and um, I fancied myself, um, you know, a tomboy, and I had no, I didn't have pelos en mi lengua tampoco, so, uh, which means no hair on my tongue. I would say things I shouldn't have. And, um, you know, they made me the, um, the sort of prim little woman you see up here today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one one more question about the Irish, if I may, plus yes. one about uh, about a, um, a slightly different aspect of what you've talked about. Could you comment on uh, the, on what was going on in Chile and the role of the Irishman O'Higgins and his role in the Latin American Revolution? For of course, Bernardo O'Higgins, who was um, the illegitimate son of the Viceroy O'Higgins of, of Chile. Uh, was one of San Martin's closest collaborators. And Bernardo O'Higgins' story is fantastic. I mean, somebody should write that in, in marvelous sort of romantic uh, fashion. Um, Bernardo O'Higgins uh, corresponded with Bolivar. Um, they didn't really have too, too much in common, but I think Bolivar uh, knew that he owed people like San Martin and, um, and O'Higgins that part of that liberation of that part of the continent, um, and was very uh, respected O'Higgins very, very much. Um, a final question, if I may. Um, the United States had a number of agents in Latin America while all this was going yes. on. There was correspondence yes. between those agents and our Secretary of State and our President. Um, could you comment on the extent to which that correspondence contributed to uh, misconceptions on the part of the North Americans. Absolutely, about absolutely. Uh, Bolivar was in the middle of, of a very rough campaign. He was not only, um, I mean, he was, uh, if I may say, suffering from hemorrhoids, from carbuncles, from any number of things while he was doing these 75,000 miles on horseback. And into this uh, moment of when he's trying to tame the uh, the plains the, in the plains of Venezuela, the uh, tremendous force. I mean, a huge expeditionary force under under Monteverde, uh, the the Spaniards who were who were fighting to keep their grip on the colony. Um, in comes uh, come these American agents, um, and uh, w one of whom most famously was a reporter. Uh, f who who came down and was sort of freelancing uh, information back to um, the the president and his cabinet 
And he was not treated very well. Because you, you can imagine, this is somebody coming with a scribbling pad in the middle of a revolution. He was not treated very well. The, the, uh, the reports that he sent back to uh, Washington were scathing, absolutely scathing. This little upstart, this you know, uh, uh, man with Napoleonic ambitions, and you couldn't say anything worse to an American than a man with Napoleonic ambitions. And so it was really through this kind of reporting back that um, uh, Bolivar began to have a very, very uh, negative reputation in the United States. Also remember that in the United States, slavery was the biggest commerce afoot. We're talking uh, about 1815 and forward. Uh, slavery was one of the, the uh, Gordon Wood describes this very, very well in his Empire of Liberty. Uh, it was our GNP uh, up here. It was, uh, slavery was huge commerce. And the, the worst thing that Washington could imagine, I'm talking about Washington as a, uh, the governing city, capital could imagine, was actually supporting anybody who used, who had liberated slaves and was using them to fight a, a, a revolution. This was just anathema. So, uh, so it, was, it was very, the, the reputation began to get worse and worse in the United States because every um, uh, sort of slander, I think, was used against Bolivar, including the fact that a lot of people were dying in this revolution. It was a very bloody revolution. It didn't speak well uh, for the whole enterprise. Thank you. Thank you.